All right, here we are with experiment one. This is slide number 33 in the presentation. Okay, uh, the point of this setup is to show that the detectors detecting at each slit and any theoretical or potential measurable availability of the which way data is not important. The only data that's important is certain availability of objective measured which way data. Okay. So you see we have the particle generator shooting particles at two slits, and those slits each have a, their own detector, D1, D2, in the circles right at the bottom of the slits. Those two detectors send a pulse on, and that pulse gets to D0, that, that little um, blue ball there. At that blue ball, there's a repeater that just accepts the pulse and produces a pulse of its own. And I do that so that there can be no difference between the pulses coming from D1 and D2. They should be identical. They're exactly the same sort of detector. But who knows? Sometimes uh, individual electronics will have their own signatures. So this makes sure that there is nothing uh, about those two pulses that come from one from D1 and one from D2 that is different. So then the pulse goes into R1, which is a recorder. So as you can see, this is an erasure experiment. As a particle goes through a slit, that creates a pulse in a detector. The detector then uh, goes into a single point at D1 before it goes into R1. So by the time it gets to R1, there's no more information about which slit it went through, just only that a pulse arrived. All right, you see uh, behind the double slits is the detectors, and behind that is... Uh, the patterns that uh, we'll look at. Sometimes we'll get a diffraction pattern, sometimes we'll get the two bar or the particle pattern. All right, we have six experiments in this A. So we will uh, look at the first one now. Experiment 1A represents a standard eraser experiment. Okay, very much like I described in, the, in uh, just looking at all the, all the, uh, experiment ones. Uh, because we have identical pulses uh, generated by a particle going through either one of the slits, and once those particles come together and have just one entry point into R1, then there is no more which way data, because all the pulses look the same. All right, now this should produce a uh, diffraction pattern, because there is no which way data. This is a conflict with traditional physics. Traditional physics sees an entanglement between the particle, the slit, and between the slit and the detector, and therefore uh, information gets passed on to R1. I say that's not true, that if you don't have objective recorded information, that's the same as there having never been any information in the first place. So that's what's interesting about this experiment. So we'll go on to the next one. This is 1B. Now, you see that we've taken R1 and we've moved it further away. And we've moved it uh, so far away that the particle will go through a slit and hit the result screen before a signal gets to R1, telling R1 which slit it went through or not. So the distance between the slits and the recorder R1 is greater than the distance between the slits and the result screen. So now we're going to have a delayed eraser experiment where we will actually erase the data after the data on the result screen has already been recorded. Okay, this is called a delayed eraser. Other than that, it works the same way as we uh, talked about it before. You have uh, a pulse will go through one slit or the other. The detector, D1 and D2, will produce a pulse. That pulse will travel down the wire until it gets to D0, and there it will descend into R1 and be recorded. Okay, so these pulses are anonymous. So after uh, it gets to the D0, any information about which path it came through is erased. We know the which path information before it gets to Z0 because these two wires that carry the path of D1 and D2 are separate. 
but that's only potential which way data. It's there in the wire. If you want to look, you can see which one of those wires has the pulse in it. But after it gets to D0, that's gone. So this is a delayed erasure experiment. And uh, again, I would say we get a diffraction pattern for basically the same reasons. Even though the eraser is now after the result screen, that will make no difference. Okay. The result screen data, R3, is not looked at until this experiment is over. Okay, we'll go on to the next experiment. Okay, this is a 1C1, and now we have made a little change in the last one. We have added uh, what I'm calling a, a which way data device that randomly injects which way path uniqueness into any pulse traveling that path just before the two paths converge. So I will be able to make this which way device. I will be able to push a button or have a random number tell this little device to turn on or turn off. If it turns off, then again, the paths are not unique. So the pulses look exactly the same. They're anonymous. But I can, at any moment, randomly or on purpose, change that and interject a 1 in the data D1 and a 2 in any pulse data that comes in D2. So now the two paths are uniquely identified. And even though they both go through the same wire at D0, they carry this uniqueness with them. So they've got a, a tag now attached to the pulse. Okay. So what we're going to do, you might uh, have figured this out, so we're going to send a particle through the slit. That particle will first get to the screen and be part of a uh, either diffraction pattern or a particle pattern, that is a wave pattern or a particle pattern. And then, after we have that dot on the screen, we are then going to say if it was off and all the data was anonymous, we will switch on this WW device and put uh, uniqueness into the detection process, and suddenly we will have which way data created after the particle has already hit the screen. Okay, so when the particle hit the screen, there was none, but later there is some which way data. So if you like, this is the opposite of a, an eraser experiment. This is not a delayed eraser, this is a delayed inserter. So we're inserting the which way data uh, after the screen data already has done its thing. So what my prediction is here is that when the which way device is off, we'll get the diffraction pattern because there'll be no which way data. And when it's on, we will get the uh, particle pattern, the two bar pattern. Okay, which means there, there, because there will be which way data when it's on. So it will know, even though it has to, it seems like it has to know in advance because that switch isn't going to be thrown until after the answer is already on the result screen. But I think that will make no difference. It'll work the same way. All right, let's go on to the next. And I, I'm not going to explain all the things on this slide. That's a little much for detail in this particular um, talk. But if you want to know more detail of exactly what's going on and how it's working this way, go to this, this uh, video on YouTube and you'll find there's a lot more information here than what, I am, what I'm telling you uh, at this time. All right. And here's a, a little bit of that information. I'll just move through that. Here we get on to 1C2. Now, this is the same experiment that we just did with a very interesting change to it. And that is that before we actually start our experiment, we are going to have particles thrown at these slits and see where they land on the detection screen. And we're gonna do it with that, that random which way data injection. We're gonna do it with that turned on, say 100,000 times, and then we'll turn it off and we'll run particles through it another 100,000 times. So we'll have a result screen with 200,000 points on it, and we will know whether those points are associated with a diffraction pattern, that is no which way data, or a particle pattern. That is, we do have which way data. 
So we will know that. Now, we will do our experiment. We have this, we have this data collected and we will do a, uh, a probability calculation for any point that hits the screen now when we actually do our experiment. I will know if a point hits the screen at a particular place, I will be able to tell what the probability is of it being in a diffraction pattern or in a particle pattern. See, what I'll do is I'll take all that data, that 200 points, and I'll look at every point on the screen, and I'll look at the five closest data points that we measured out of that 200,000 points. I'll look at the five closest data points to that point on the screen. And let's say three of those closest points were diffraction patterns and two were particle patterns. In that case, the probability of getting of that point being a diffraction pattern will be three fifths, three out of five. The probability of it being a particle pattern will be two out of five. So see, we'll have a, a probability of being in a diffraction or a particle pattern for every point on the result screen. Now we're going to uh, hook a little microprocessor. You see that attached to R3. That's the recording device for the result screen. That microprocessor is going to apply that little probability algorithm that we're going to make is going to apply that. Actually, it'll be a lookup table. It'll look up the position on the screen and then it'll output a probability distribution. We're going to know that probability distribution before the particle gets to the which way data injectors. So when the detection signal is about where those dashed blue lines are, the detection signal coming out of D1 and D2, by that time we will already have a prediction of whether that particle is in a particle pattern or a wave pattern. Okay, the wave pattern being the uh, diffraction pattern, the particle pattern being the two bar pattern. So now, knowing that, we can randomly change that device that produces uh, either ran you know, random which way data. When it's on, we get um, which way data and get a particle pattern. When it's off, we get no which way data, which then uh, will give us a diffraction pattern. But we'll already have the prediction of that from the result screen before that random uh, number is, is chosen to decide whether it's on or off. So that uh, is really backing reality into a corner and forcing it to show us some of its, uh, some of its secrets. This random number generator can be a natural event-based random number generator. That is something that is, uh, produces a random number based on radioactive decay. Now, radioactive decay is entirely random. The direction of that decay uh, is random. And we're going to be able to predict how that radioactive nucleus is going to decay, whether it's going to send a particle to the detector on the right side or on the left side of it. And we'll we will predict that before the atom decays, okay, before the element uh, shoots that particle off. Now, this should be impossible, according to uh, uh, standard physics. You shouldn't be able to predict how a particle will leave a, uh, a nucleus in a radioactive decay. But we're going to do that. So um, we'll, be, we'll predict it because of this microprocessor that we have uh, will be telling us what part of the pattern it's in. And if it tells us it's in a, a diffraction pattern, then we'll predict that the uh, random which way data injection is off. And if it tells us it's going to be in a particle pattern, we'll predict that the random which way injection device will be on. Uh, and uh, if you want to know why we come to that conclusion, you'll have to look at this and read all the details. Uh, we don't really have time for that, but just want to tell you what the experiment's doing. So this is a pretty novel experiment. Uh, it does something that I don't think any experiment's uh, done before. In order to do this experiment, we're going to have to deconflict our wave and particle data on the screen. And how we do that is by adjusting the distance between the slits 
the wavelength, if it's, if it's a light that we're using, or the, the kind of particle, like an electron, that we're using. And we adjust the particle or the wavelength, the separation, the distance to the screen. All of those things will make a difference as to exactly where the particle hits on the screen. And we will adjust those so as to deconflict those two patterns so that the, the, we know that the, if we get a dot someplace, we can have a better probability that we know what pattern it comes from. So this is just a picture showing you uh, how we will do that. And it won't look as good as this picture. Obviously, we can't make all the dots that are in a, in a uh, uh, particle pattern, the two bars that you see, the two blue bars. They're not all going to line up very neatly and not touch any of the other patterns. They're all going to smear a little bit over each other. But that's all right. That won't hurt the experiment. If there's a probability of 70% that it's a diffraction pattern, then 70% of the time we should get a correct guess. So it will work, even if only a small number uh, of particles uh, have a 100% certainty of what pattern it comes from. Now we have the 1D, E, and F, which are very similar to what we've just done, except we no longer are going to um, talk about the, uh, the, the which way device that we talked about before. So these are um, a little different. This is uh, just a standard double slit experiment. There's uh, no eraser here because these detectors now are outputting a unique pulse. So the pulse that they put out can be identified in R1 as being from slit 1 or slit 2, detector 1 or detector 2. So that detector maybe has a little header material goes with the pulse that says slit 1 and the D2 has a little header that uh, goes with the pulse that it creates that says slit 2. So now there's no eraser at D0. So we collect all the which way data and what you see, what we're going to get is a is a particle pattern, the two bar pattern. That's just standard double slit. Okay. Now we're going to make a double slit with an extended distance and time for the for the signal to get out to R1. Okay. So again, the output's unique. Uh, the the time it takes for a particle to get out to R1 is longer, quite longer than the uh, time it takes the particle to get to the screen. And we're also going to find a particle pattern. It makes no difference whether this R1 gets its data before or after R3. R3 is the collector for the result screen. Okay, it really doesn't make any difference whether it's before or after. We're still going to get that two-particle pattern. Next. All right, now 1F. This time we're going to introduce a fast switch rather than put uh, uniqueness in each one of the pathways from detector 1 to detect and detector 2 to R1, we're going to actually put a switch right after the two signals go together. What that switch does is it disconnects R1. So it takes R1 offline, breaks that circuit. So R1 won't get anything. Before, R1 was getting pulses, but uh, pulses that were anonymous. Here, this fast switch will create a delayed eraser when the switch is, is uh, on and R1 is disconnected. That data is going to be erased in the sense that it won't be recorded. It's not that it's recorded and erased. It's just never recorded. So we'll call that eraser. So this is a little different than what we've done before. Um, puts it all in a little different context, and fast switches are simple things and inexpensive things compared to which way data injectors. So this will be a little more efficient. And here you see we're going to play the same game as we did before with a microprocessor. And this time what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to predict, again, another random number. We're going to let a random number uh, predict or a random number determine whether this switch is on or off. And we will again be able to predict that random number before the atom ever decays to give us that random number. All right, very similar to the one we saw before, just done uh, differently, um, which has a little different physics to it, but comes out to the same result.